Hi, my name is Chad and I work for the Neil Squire Society and I help run a project called Makers Making Change. You're taking part of a Makers Making Change event at the Gizmo in Idaho and I'm going to talk a little bit about the project you're going to be building the Lipstick today. I would love to see pictures of what you guys are doing, sorry I can't be there in person. So send them to us on your favorite social media channel. On Twitter, we're at Maker Make Change. On Instagram, we're at Makers Making Change. Or use that hashtag, Make Access. But we'd love to see your guys' work as you're working through it. So Makers Making Change is an initiative of the Neil Squire Society, which is a Canadian nonprofit organization. Uh, it's been around for almost 35 years that really focuses on how technology can help people with disabilities. Our funding for Makers Making Change has been provided by the Google Foundation, which won an Innovation Award for the Lip Sync, the project you're building today. The Vancouver Foundation will help us pilot this model in British Columbia, Canada, and from a couple of different parts of the Government of Canada, Social Development Partnership Program and Innovation Science and Economic Development. So I wanted to give some uh, thank you to our sponsors who helped fund this work. So who's Neil Squire? You might be asking, why the Neil Squire Society? Neil Squire was a young man who in the 1980s got in a car accident and he broke his neck right at the C1, C2 level, right at the sort of base of his skull. Uh, he survived the accident, but due to his injury, he was unable to move his legs, his arms, uh, had difficult breathing, which is in a breathing apparatus, uh, and sometimes a very difficult time talking, which sometimes had to kind of blink once yes, twice no. So here you had this bright young man who uh, literally was sort of trapped in his bed, sometimes even trapped in his body. So Neil's uncle, Bill Cameron, uh, visited Neil and thought, you know, there's got to be something that we can do for Neil. We can't have this young man spend the rest of his life in a hospital bed staring at a ceiling. You know, he was an engineer that worked at uh, the University of British Columbia, and him with a couple of summer students started to work on the first generation of sip and puff systems that could connect to different technology. So Neil, by sipping and puffing on that tube, could kind of send like a yes or a no, a one or a zero. That's sort of binary communication. But what they did was they developed that to translate to Morse code. So uh, SIP became a dot, and the puff became a dash, and they taught Neil Morse code to control a teletype machine. And then they wrote some software to connect to the first generation Apple IIe computer. So Neil, by sipping puffing on a tube, was able to write sentences on the screen, print out letters, had full control of the computer, all through sipping puffing on a tube. So this was a big innovation at the time, and there were other people at the rehab hospital that also wanted to use technology as Neil was, but had different disabilities. They needed different accommodations. Uh, so that's how their organization was founded. Uh, Neil passed away, started becoming a nonprofit, so we're named in the memory of Neil. Now the product Neil used continued to evolve, uh, especially when computers started using mice, right? Use a mouse to move a cursor around the screen. So this product is called the Joust. It's a very similar concept. You can sip and puff. Now that's so usually left click, right click, and the joystick can move the mouse cursor up, down, left or right. And this is still a commercially available item, the Joust. In fact, uh, here's uh, some from our board of directors, Don Danbrook. He spent his entire career working uh, for the Canadian Revenue Agency, now in property management, um, and he uses the Joust to control mouse cursor. And then he'll see a microphone there. He uses speech recognition so he can talk and the screen types. It gives him full ability as a computer, just like you or me. Uh, the problem with the Joust is it doesn't really work great on mobile devices. It's uh, fairly large and heavy. It has a separate control box that needs to be plugged into the wall. So it's not a mobile solution. Uh, mobile devices also have another problem. If you can't use your hands, how to use a touchscreen device if you can't touch the device. So through the support of the Google Foundation and our other funders, we propose to develop the Lip Sync, which is an evolution of the Joust. It's a mouth operated mouse emulator, basically a mouse using your mouth. Um, so there's a couple of key differences. Uh, one is small and lightweight. All the controls are in the head of the device. And this is what you'll be building today. Um, it runs on an Arduino computer. Uh, which is fairly low power, and uh, you can also put in a Bluetooth chip so it can connect via Bluetooth. So it allows it to work not only on a desktop or a laptop, but also on tablets and mobile devices. 
The other major difference is this isn't a commercial project that you can go and buy through an assistive technology distributor. This is an open source hardware project, which means all of our files, all of our parts can be purchased through us, or you can buy them yourself. You can download the files to 3D print the outer shell, the joystick parts. Um, and it can essentially be made sort of anywhere for someone that wants to spend the time to volunteer the community to give back. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit about the build, just so you uh, know some best practices and tips to have a successful build of the LipSync. First of all, you'll be using a few, a few different tools. Primarily a soldering iron uh, to put on the different components. You'll use wire snips to cut off some of the extra leads. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be gluing a few things. You may need an X-Acto knife or a solder sucker to um, peel things or to correct some of your errors. Just a couple of things about safety. Um, with a soldering iron, it does get hot. So it's advised that you wear eye protection. Goggles, so there's no accidents. Also, when you're trimming leads, uh, when you're using your wire snips, you want to make sure none of those little pieces fly and hit someone in the eye. So safety goggles are recommended. Also, when you're soldering, most solder does have lead in it, which is not part of a balanced diet. So we recommend that when you are taking a break, uh, to wash your hands thoroughly uh, before you eat. Um, so when you solder, if you haven't done soldering before, you want a refresher. Uh, the right part of this diagram is the soldering iron, the left part is the solder. So the key piece is to apply heat to the component and the lead uh, for a couple seconds to kind of heat that area up. Then you apply solder and don't be afraid to push the solder in a bit. Some people just tap with the solder, push the solder in a bit. Um, and then when you remove the solder, keep the iron there. That helps transfer the heat and so the solder goes all the way around the lead. And it should look like a nice volcano by the time you pull your soldering iron away. You want it to be connected all the way around the circle so that um, you have a good solid connection. So I'm going to walk you through different parts of the build here now. Uh, so step one is putting on main the components on the main circuit board. That includes uh, some resistors, some buttons, a couple jumpers. Now these jumpers sometimes come in a row of 10 in your kit, so you may have to snap two off. So you'll have two and then eight, and then you break those other eight into groups of four. Um, and other components, including the LED light. This is all pretty simple, straightforward soldering. You just want to make sure the components, especially those buttons, are flush to the board. The second step is to build the sip and puff switchboard. Um, there's a couple of tricky components of this. First of all, those three yellow things all look similar, but they are different. Those capacitors, it matters where those go. So they line up from left to right if you're looking at it this way, 103, 105, 471. The other part that's tricky is the sip of puff switch. It is not through hole soldering, it is surface mount soldering. So what we recommend you do is you put a bit of solder on the pad, a bit of solder on the leg of the sip of puff switch, and then you heat it up and it'll sink down. You're just gonna make sure that solder flows over top of the leg of the board onto the pad so it's a good solid connection. That's a, a common error I would say is that those solder legs are not soldered properly down to this board. So just make sure the solder flows over the leg and onto the pad so it's well connected. The third step is connecting these two boards together. Um, you just want to make sure that you put the sip of puff switch board, it goes onto the bottom of the circuit board. Those other components you put on are on the top, the buttons, the resistors. So this one goes onto the bottom. The fourth step is putting these header pins on, This is uh, which allows you to connect your Arduino microcomputer, which plugs into those. So by putting those header pins on, um, just make sure again that those go on this side of the board, the side with the writing. Um, uh, it's a lot of work to desolder those 17 pins to get those out, so you want to put those along this board here. The more complicated part of the build is the joystick. Uh, it has a number of smaller mechanical parts, so there's still some soldering but it's more of a mechanical sort of process. So we got a few sort of tips to get you through this part of the build. First of all, uh, the joystick has three 3D printed parts. You're going to make sure that you get out the support material from the print. So you're going to clear out all of this sort of zigzaggy stuff on this board. The screw holes may have some 3D printed parts that you need to pull out. So you can use a knife, or grab it with pliers, um, and get that outer ring. Same thing with this uh, T or X shaped piece. There's sometimes a square in the middle. 
as well as an outer ring, you're going to need to clear that out so the components fit more snug together. So make sure you remove all that support material from your print. Another thing that I've seen gone wrong is <clears throat> these standoffs. Two are shorter, they're 10 millimeters. Two are longer, they're 15 millimeters. When all four are in, it should be nice and even. So the shorter ones go on the ones that got the little stand up on them. And the longer ones go on the ones that got the recess indent into them. This is a really common problem. Um, when you put this piece in here, you want to glue this white lure lock to this black piece. And you want to make sure it's glued in fairly well. If this white piece spins inside of there, what happens is there's a uh, the tube for the sip and puff goes onto there, and the tube turns and kinks and that stops the sip and puff from uh, working or going in. And then you have to take your whole joystick apart to fix that. So just apply um, a liberal amount of glue to connect that white lure lock to that black piece. Uh, this picture here is just showing the placement of these bumper pads. Uh, there should be a slight etching in the 3D print, but if you can't see it, you just want to get those bumper pads up to the edge of this black center piece. Okay, you don't want it out on the far edge of the X or the T, you want it close to the center. You're also going to apply some baby powder onto those bumps. You only need a, uh, a little bit, just kind of smudge and rub it in. Uh, it just helps it make sure it doesn't stick too much. Okay, um, obviously by far the most sensitive part of the build where people have difficulties are these guys. These things are sticking up here. These are force sensing resistors. Um, they make the joystick work when uh, they sense pressure on the top part. It sort of tells it that all oh, this direction being pushed this way. Um, but these are very finicky to heat. Uh, if you touch the side of the soldering iron it melts very quickly. So uh, be careful of these. Now you can see they go in on a right angle, not a right angle, but a 40, 30 to 40 degree angle. Uh, that helps them because you need to bend them around without creasing them. Um, also make sure that uh, this part with the sort of design piece on it is facing towards the center. The, the black piece will face out. I got another picture of it showing here. So just make sure those are facing the right way and go in and at an angle. To support you getting them in on a good angle, we have a new sort of joystick standoff where you can put that board in, and there's a little slot, it's a little dark here, but there's a little slot where the FSR slides in first, you put the board in, and it makes soldering it quite easy. When you do that, make sure the black circle side is facing out, so they're, that they're in the right way. When you put those pieces through the joystick board, um, there is like a thin layer, like a sticker, that you're going to peel off. Do not peel off the black back pad. I've seen that happen frequently. Um, it's a very thin little piece. Uh, the black pads it should stay on the FSR and it is tacky so you can actually stick it right onto the board. So just make sure you kind of peel that piece off. Some people use a nail or like their fingernail. Uh, some people use an X-Acto knife. Just be aware of that. So this shows what the FSRs look like when you're finished sort of that piece together. They sort of arch around and through the hole. Okay. They don't, they don't get creased at a right angle. Okay, they kind of arch around. Okay, if you get a crease, it may uh, the connectivity of that piece may not work. You may have to switch it. So that's what it looks like when they're all stuck in. You can see those standoffs are all at a nice level height. They're stuck down to the board. Um, again, use that joystick or standoff piece that you put the FSRs on to hold it up. And the reason why is if you put weight on these rounded pieces and push down on it, you can crease, crack, or break them. So use that and it provides basically a spacer so that when you apply pressure putting the other pieces together, you aren't breaking those FSRs on the bottom. When you put the joystick parts together, there's a tube that goes um, from that lure lock piece and it snakes through here. This part is very tight, just so you know that. It's a very tight part of the build. The tube goes through the center and onto the outer part of this joystick board, okay? So just know that FSR is going to be very snug, it's going to be very tight fit, uh, and it goes through and over that, and that's so when someone uh, puffs on the mouthpiece, that air goes through and registers the sip and puff board. Okay, um, normally when I'm at a build event, I help you guys with this part, I won't be there. So um, the USB cable that connects to the Arduino board goes through the shell and plugs into the Arduino. Just be very careful, this piece of the Arduino board is uh, not on it very well, it's really easy to rip it off. So don't tug or pull on the cable. When you put it into the shell, 
it is better to push the board in along the slots that are along the bottom. At the top and bottom, it fits in those slots, it slides in. It's a little bit of an angle, it's a little tricky to get in. Um, you might have to kind of fidget it, and wiggle a little bit, put it in like a 20 degree angle as you slide it in. But don't pull on the cable. If you pull on the cable, you're going to rip the USB port off of the Arduino. And then that Arduino is basically garbage unless you have someone with uh, that can really do tiny minute soldering, put it back on. Okay, so just don't pull on that cable as you put it in. This is it's a very tight fit, but it keeps it snug in there when you assemble it. When you got the whole vice built, um, you do need to, to calibrate the joystick. So uh, what you do here is you press these two buttons on the back of the lip sync together, and it'll blink at the top, and then you're going to do a calibration sequence, which basically when it continues to blink green straight, you hold it up for five seconds until it turns red, and then you hold it right for five seconds until it turns red, and then down for five seconds until it turns red, and then left. And what that basically is doing is showing what the maximum value of the FSR when it's being pushed registers at, and it normalizes those values to make sure that it moves right as fast as it moves left or up as fast as it moves down. So it uh, moves at consistent speed. So that's what it should look like when you're in. You should have, when you're finished, you should have uh, a lip sync built. Um, the mouth piece sort of just screws onto the front. And then a user can use that mouth piece to move a mouse cursor up, down, right, or left. They can puff to tap, sip to go back. Basically gives it someone who can't use their hands the full ability as a touchscreen device or a laptop or a desktop um, using their mouth as a mouse. So I hope that's helpful in walking you through the build. Tweet us some fancy pictures. Don't be afraid to contact us if you've got questions. And I wish you a successful build in making these lip sync devices. It's uh, just under a couple hundred bucks for the parts uh, and it has tremendous impact on the life of selling the disability. So thank you for volunteering your time to make this device. Um, best of luck, and uh, I look forward to seeing the pictures from your build. Best wishes.